Greetings. My name is Louis Molina, and I'm the host of the Life Pro Podcast. Today's guest is Louisiana State Treasurer John Schroeder, who is currently running for the governor's office. As a side note, our production is in no way endorsing this candidate. I personally like to listen to anyone of any political background, philosophy, and origin. We hope you enjoy today's production. But how you been? I can't complain, man. Yeah. Busy. Busy. I'd imagine. Big state. Yeah. yeah. You've, have you been to every parish? Um, not every, but I've I've touched quite a few. Yeah. You know, over the last couple of years, you know? Yeah. So I don't know if you, I mean, I guess you could if you made a commitment to hit every parish, but you know, I haven't missed too many. Let's mm -hmm. just say it that way. I got to tell you, because uh, I listened to the debate that uh, they aired Friday, was mm -hmm. it? Yeah. Out of Lafayette. Yeah. How'd that go for you? How, how'd you think you, you no, feel man, you performed? I, I, it's not a performance for me. You okay. Know, it is what it is. So I, I tell people I, I have a different message than, than everybody else in the race and we'll have to decide, you know, what, what you want to, who you want to be the CEO, as I say. Yeah, you know, because I think the state needs a CEO. So that's what I, I was impressed. Just, just to give the audience a little background, I met you mm -hmm. first back in 2010 when we opened up our first door Is in that Covington. The you open it? Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. been uh, since 2010, and I loved talking to you back then. I guess before you entered politics, you, uh, come, you come from a small business yeah. mindset and a uh, business mindset. So I just got into politics since 2008. Okay, but man, I had the tobacco store. Uh, that I opened, geez, I'm probably, what year did I open that? It had to be like 1992, 93. Okay. And I opened a discount tobacco store on Highway 59. You know. Did you, uh, you did you still sell? open to this day. Oh, okay. It's on its third owner. Okay. But it's still open. You know, Town Crier? Yeah. I know Randy, at Randy Town Crier. Yeah, yeah, they bought it. Wow. Yeah. Man, that's cool. Yeah. See, I lo I always loved hearing you, like your insight into business back then. Mm -hmm. And um, no, I remember that. I remember talking yeah. to you and your dad a lot yep. about the ins and outs of the business. You know, mm -hmm. I'm 62 now. So I've been at it a long time. I'm sort of in my mentorship at, at stage of my career now. You know, we um, we don't have any retail businesses. We sold our last retail business at the beginning of the year in January. So, I mean, from tobacco store laundromats, tanning salon, sports bar, grocery, hair salon, security business, paint store. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've been in, there's not too many retail. I've, I've sold my c cigars, not quite what y'all got going on here, mm -hmm. you know, but I've been around the block. But you understand the plight Absolutely. and the needs of a small business Absolutely. person. Absolutely. But also understand that government could give a rat rip about small business, and that's a problem. Mm -hmm. And I tell people I, I get tired of hearing about, man, we need to bring business in. We need to bring business in. We got to help the businesses that we have, okay? From a from a deregulation standpoint, and I don't, I'm, and I'm not saying you shouldn't pay your taxes and all that. That's not what I'm talking about. Yeah, we should figure out what obstacles there is to small business, get them out of the way. Get our small businesses thriving because those will be our best ambassadors for new business to come into Louisiana. Mm -hmm. But nobody thinks that way. Yeah, I haven't heard anybody say that besides me. So I've been impressed with just the logistics of your campaign. I just I heard you a few weeks ago on the Don Dubuque mm -hmm. Outdoor Show yeah. that you were going down to what Saint Bernard, Saint Bernard was it to talk mm -hmm. to the, to the local fishermen yep. and shrimpers. Yep. What was that like when you talked to them? An education. Yeah, you know, and I I tell people this. Look, I'm a I'm a CEO type, meaning mm -hmm. you bring a problem to a CEO, he or she will find a way to get to fix it, mm -hmm. and that's what you want. I mean, but if you're waiting for that person who has an expertise in wildlife and fisheries and education and infrastructure and the chemical industry and the insurance industry, and I could go on and on and on, that person doesn't exist. Okay. But you need somebody who who's capable of putting a team together mm -hmm. of, of, of quality folks who have the intellect, who also have, have the ability to entrepreneur their way. Their glass has to be half full. I mean, people, you know, being in business now for a while, um, when somebody poses me a problem, I've, I've, I have a solution. You know, I don't let people who constantly are naysayers rule my day. 
So you have to surround yourself with those kind of people who are forward thinking kind of people. And how do you move the ball up the hill constantly? Every day is how do you move the ball up the hill? Government doesn't function the way you function. Government does not know how to do that. So if you don't bring people to the table who understand that, I guess, methodology, it's just not going to happen. It's like hamsters on a wheel. They're very, very inefficient and, um, and not to anybody's fault, but nobody brings efficiencies to the table. So I tell people quite frankly, look, I'm, I'm just a business guy who knows how to run an operation. I'm, I start with the money. It all starts with the money mm-hmm. and how to, how to manage it and operate. And, you know, that's, that's what I want to do as the governor of Louisiana. After, after serving as treasurer and managing the billions of dollars, you know, this past fiscal year was $60 billion. This year is about $44 billion. That's per year. Um, I've saw, I saw it firsthand. You know, but we've done a good job at Treasury, and I tell people this isn't about as much as what I want to change, as much as I can do across government what I've done at the Department of Treasury. And that's what I'm asking the voters to do. Um, if you want a business guy, if you think government should operate like a business, there's seven top tier, six, one dropped out today. It was There's four lawyers, an engineer, or, or now today there's three lawyers, two engineers, and a business guy. Okay. You know, so, and I'm the business guy. Uh, it's time you have somebody that goes to the Capitol, works five Mondays a week to solve problems. I could care less about all the frills that come along with the positions. That's not why I'm, I'm, I'm doing this. In fact, you're looking at the driver and you're looking at the guy, you're looking at the security detail and you're looking at the guy that washes the frigging car once yeah. a week, you know, cause that's what I am. I've all, I'll always be that. I could drive whatever I want and live wherever I want to a certain extent. I can't go live in Malibu. Yeah, you know, but Ellie and I have done well in our business career. We we we're, we're humble people. Um, I don't need anything from anybody. I don't mean that in a cocky way. I'm not for sale. Yeah, and I've never been for sale. And I'm tired of watching the cronyism, corruption, pollute and infect every decision that happens in this state. And that's one thing, like for me, with Louisiana, I feel I feel like this state should be richer than it is. Right, all the resources we have, but over the years, seeing the cronyism, the conflicts of interest, it it just deprives and, and keeps yeah. the state from progressing. And Absolutely. I mean, you don't have to look far to Texas and Florida and what yeah. they've done. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's pitiful. I mean, just what's in the newspaper this week, it's absolutely disgusts me. Mm-hmm. Um, the things that I watch that happens, and and not just at the state level, at the local levels. You know, we tolerate it. We we the citizens of Louisiana tolerate this, and we have to we have to stop it. So, what issues did you find, like, for example, in the in the uh, state treasury mm-hmm. uh, or the treasury department? Mm-hmm. Like, Nate, can you give me an example of a problem you saw, and what did you do to resolve that issue? Well, look, I'm not going to say it's a problem as much or, as it yeah. is just the culture of change, mm-hmm. and how do you improve? You know, how do you how do you do things better and quicker, whether that's the reporting that you have to do, how do you provide that? Can you do that um, through technology and get rid of the, the paper? And, you know, can you use technology? And I say you can in just about every aspect of our business. We were, ba- we were able to invest and perform better and quicker, okay, and more reliable. Our unclaimed property program is a great example. You know, we were ranked um, – um, in the 30s, in the lower 30s, and and two years ago we were we were named the top program in America. You know we went we've done more claims in the last six years than we did in the first 44 years combined. Whoa! How do we do that? No different than what you do here. You you have to invest in infrastructure. Mm-hmm. You have to bring on some talent, and then you have to hold them accountable. You know. To me, that would be the challenge a challenging. Um thing is how do you attract talent away yeah. from the private sector yeah. right you got to pay them man it's no different uh, right no but like when when the private sector obviously has more money i guess they than do a lot of public entities they do what do you what are some of the ideas you've come up with how do you attract that talent you know I, I, you know i don't know that's a good question um we we just were able to you know okay i, I have 10 executives eight of them are female and i think State government is more geared, sort of almost like a teacher job. It's is is it's a it's a good job for females mm-hmm. because they get a lot of holidays. So when the kids are off of school, they're off of school. Meaning, 
you know, there's like 14 state holidays, not counting all the other holidays. You know, so they get a lot of days off, but the, but it typically coincides with kids. They get good benefits, good health benefits, a good retirement. So it's it's a good job for somebody in the couple, husband or wife. And it just so happens we have a lot of a lot of females, and I I, I don't know. There's a, I, I, there's I don't I've never sat down and really thought about it why, but you know from from a motherhood standpoint, I'm very much about my mothers. You know, and I I I want I want my mothers to be taught like or treated like my wife being a mother. You mm -hmm. know, so I've brought a lot of that personal um, care to to Treasury. Um, I'm very sympathetic to their needs with their kids being sick and all that kind of stuff, you know, but I have some quality, quality women that work for the department of treasury. And I, I love these ladies. They work very hard. Um, not that I don't like my dudes cause I do, um, you know, my executive council is a guy, my chief investment officer is a guy, but everybody else is, um, they're all females. They're all rock stars. Yeah. Now, can you give us insight into like your upbringing where let, let's, let's, Learn about you and, yeah, so and your I'm origin. A, I'm a blue-collar boy, grew up in Metairie. My dad was a professional baseball player His, and right out of high school got drafted. But he was an entrepreneur, sold cars, and eventually became a car dealer. And, you know, I always, I always wanted to do one of two things, man. I don't know why early on I either want to be an FBI agent or be in business. And luckily for me, I've done – practically I've done both. I, instead of an FBI agent, I was a – Military. I was in the infantry, military intelligence, CID, which is a criminal investigation division. I was a special agent in the army. My retina hemorrhaged when I was about 29 years old. I came back home and been been in my business career since. And I, I talked about that earlier. But no, I, we grew up in a real blue collar family, five brothers and sisters. There were seven of us total. And, um, you know, we just came up, worked hard, close Catholic family. And, uh, you know, don't mess with the Schroders. We, we had each other's backs, you know, that kind of thing. A typical Catholic family growing up in Metairie. Uh, we went to all public high schools, all public colleges. You know, my parents didn't do college, but, uh, you know, we worked hard. But 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 I'm a very conservative, and I didn't say I was very Democrat or Republican. I'm very conservative. And I get asked a lot, what does that mean exactly? Well, that means you um, you ate everything that they put on your, ta on your plate, you didn't waste anything. Yeah. You helped your neighbor. Mm -hmm. You treated other people how you wanted to be treated. You were respectful. We learned how to say yes, sir, no, sir. You know, you had your manners. You treated women uh, or girls right. You know, um, not that I was always perfect at that, but that's what that's what we taught. Not mm -hmm. look at sixty two. I still have unbelievable manners, and when it comes to people, you know, the military taught me a lot of discipline, but. I, it sort of ingrained the discipline in me. I already had it in me. But, uh, you know, then then uh, Ellie and I have lived on the North Shore now for between Tangipaho and St. Tanny for over 40 years. We've been married 38. We both met at Southeast, and she's a retired teacher and assistant principal. She's been in the business world. You know, she's been right with me my entire career and me with her, her entire career. So we're just ordinary guys who done, have done a lot in our life to help people, not keeping score. You know, I'm not a scorekeeper. You know, has everything in our lives gone perfectly the way we wanted it? No. Um, but we've had an unbelievable life. And and if, if I was to go meet my maker tomorrow, he's not going to ask me why I didn't help those that couldn't help themselves. You know, that's what I sort of pride myself in. I treat people equally. Man, that's something I brought to Treasury, man. I, I make sure that the rules are the rules and access are equal to all. Mm -hmm. That means we, te we treat the big shots in, by their own definition <clears throat> the same we treat the little shots. You want to meet with the Treasurer? You meet with the Treasurer. Yeah. I so, never turn down a meeting. So it sounds like you're trying to be more approachable. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, Instead I, of like some of these politicians – that maybe rule from an ivory tower yeah, you or think they, you, they lose you, connection. With you think any of them would be sitting here at eight o'clock at night? Right. No, no. Look, I work for you, you know, so th this was a matter of just finding a time to do it. No. Now, of course I knew you and um, I didn't, I didn't remember. Yeah, but you didn't you. have to come here. So no, no we, we appreciate no, that, but, especially at this time. But look, like, I like offering my experiences and, and my plight to others, you know, you're a young man and, and I want you to see that, you know, as long as you treat 
I believe life treats you the way you treat life. I want you to see that in the in the flesh. You know, um, I don't think I'm any better than anybody else. The only difference between me and you is time. You know, I have wisdom on my side. You know, but the only reason you don't have that is time. And you're going to be sitting in this seat one day, and some young guy over there is going to be interviewing you on this podcast. Yeah. You know. Well, and that's what has impressed me so far, just looking at um, your campaign, that you, you're you going out and you're meeting with people directly. It's yeah. almost like a grassroots campaign, but you're getting in front of people. Yeah, so don't, like, that's what happens when you don't have the most money. You know, yeah. you got to you gotta do it. But I enjoy, look, I, I, I sit here full of energy. I've been gone for two days. You know, I won't get home to sleep in my bed till Saturday night. You know, so um, I enjoy it. I love sharing my thoughts with people because at the very least, I'm telling people what the problems are, what do we need to do to fix them, and just sharing my experiences. And I, and I hope at the very least through this campaign, I educate people and help them understand things better and see what we better do to fix them. What are the three top issues a lot of people are voicing to you as you travel the state? Top three issues. Yeah, the lack of faith they have in government. People, okay. don't, trust, people don't trust government. <clears throat> so I always talk about the restoring the faith and trust in government. Obviously, insurance and crime are huge issues. Crime's probably at the top of the list. Insurance is next. And, mm -hmm. you know, you could interchange education and crime um, um, sometimes. But those are the four issues, the cronyism, corruption, education, crime, and insurance. You know, mm -hmm. all very difficult things to fix, except right. the cronyism. The cronyism can start with me. You know, I've never taken a dime of your money, and I've never given a dime of your money to anybody. I have a zero tolerance when it comes to cronyism, and that has to start with the governor. And the governor cannot ignore what's going on behind closed doors. He has to hold his staff accountable. They will live to the same standard that I live, and that's we're not taking anything from anybody because if you're going to build trust in the process, then you have to respect the process and you can't take advantage of the process. And people take advantage of this process a lot. And it's really disgusting, to be honest with you. It's probably the thing that bothers me the most. This is culture, huh? That, this is culture. This... I mean, you see it. I mean, I don't mind saying it. You you look at what the Attorney General's done right now with this insurance issue. And I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. Well, so enlightened, because we have people that listen from all over the country. Yeah. So, kind of give them some background yeah, on what you're so, talking about. So right now, there's a, a situation where the... the um, insurance commissioner has levied the biggest fine in state's history against a firm out of Texas who, who was preying on, um, on, on people after the last hurricane. And to this day, that firm owes the citizens of Louisiana just over $20 million. And the, ins the insurance commissioner, they did their, um, investigation. They turn it over to the attorney general's office. The attorney general's office has elected to do nothing. And on the same day that that case got turned over to the attorney general, he took a $5,000 donation from that firm out of Texas. And then he's going to say, well, I don't know who all, I get thousands and thousands of donations. Well, BS, you don't take a donation as the attorney general and not know who, who the money's coming from. Okay. The, the attorney general's position, in my opinion, has to be the epitome of rule following. And it may not be illegal, but just because it's right doesn't mean it's right. You know what I mean? Just because you can doesn't mean you should. And just because you could doesn't mean you should. Because you erode the faith that people have in you. Um, uh, you shouldn't have a law that dictates you from doing the right thing. And if you take money from from people who you have to oversee from a criminal standpoint, it it smells. It looks bad. And then there's an article out last week that you know he settled a lawsuit for sixty plus million dollars, and only to a couple months later to take a twenty five thousand dollar donation to his pack. The lady running for attorney general took a, 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 a donation to her pack, and then he gave a hundred thousand dollars to the state party. That looks really, really bad. Is it illegal? Uh, probably not, but it erodes the confidence that people have instilled upon that office, and it looks bad. It looks like you played, you paid to play, 
And that's what I'm trying to end in this state. Yeah. So you're talking about like what's legal versus what might be ethical. So right. even though things may have been done that were legal by the book, it looks like yeah. from, from the, from the end viewer or voter. It's called cronyism. Yeah. You know, and this state suffers from it. So yeah. if the people at the highest level do this, what's the standard below them? Yeah. I want an attorney general who has impeccable character and able to discern between right and right. Mm -hmm. Because there are many things that may be right, but it's, it doesn't look right. It doesn't smell right. So you don't do it. And, and, if you know, I have, and if I have to explain that to you as the state treasurer, that's a problem. Yeah. And so like talking to a lot of con consumers, you know, we deal with a lot of people uh, throughout the course of a day or week or month. And then talking to a lot of young people, the sentiment I get just of their view of government, just in general in this country, it's, it's so low. I mean, there's yeah. no, no, no faith in any, in either right. party. No, that's because we're so busy fighting over politics and having culture wars. You know, I was elected to manage a $60 billion operation, not fight culture wars. That's, I tell people, I deal with my culture war on Sunday when I go to church, mm. you know, but we need to pay attention to the, to the basics. We've gotten away from the basics. We get lost in all these social issues, all while the infrastructure of this state is crumbling. I don't necessarily mean roads and bridges, all those are pretty sucky in Louisiana, mm -hmm. but I mean, how do you deliver education? How do you deliver law enforcement, DOTD, Department of Revenue, you know, the things where the public interacts with government? We're not doing any of them well. Mm -hmm. So we need to start from scratch. You know, we, we, need a, we need to work on our foundation. You know, you can't, you can't um, sell cigars unless you have a really good humidor, you know, and you can't deliver services unless you have good infrastructure to provide those services. And we haven't had a governor in some time now that manages the infrastructure in this state. And as I said, I don't mean roads and bridges. I mean, how do you deliver? How do you invest in technology and provide better services to the taxpayer? Because that's, that's where the taxpayer touches government the most through the Department of Revenue, through the Department of Motor Vehicles, where you get your driver's license, you know, wildlife and fisheries, where all the hunters get th their stuff. So mm -hmm. we have to make sure we're doing a, a, a great job because that's what, you pay for, that's what you pay for us to do. And one of my favorite sayings to my staff, I'm not your boss, that 4.6 million people outside are our bosses. I'm just the manager, you know. So it's a culture, it's a mindset. That's what I bring to the table. Is it, in, is it a big enough issue to get elected governor? You know, I don't know, but I can tell you as your state treasurer, that's what's infected this this state. We we don't do it. We're not very efficient. We don't invest in technology, and therefore we suffer for it. Going back to the uh, the the citizens in Saint Bernard who you visited, mm -hmm. especially like shrimpers. I know shrimpers. There, there's a thing going on. Can you do you? Do you yeah, man. It's, what, what's going on with with yeah. the shrimping industry? Well, they're getting screwed by the by the foreign shrimp. Okay, and nobody's got that back. I mean, I don't know how else to say it. Uh, they, they're getting put out of business by foreign nationals uh, who are coming into our country, bringing their cheap, um, probably infected, bacteria-ridden shrimp that we eating, and we're not. We need to we need to see what we can do to stop it. Yeah, you know. So well, I'm 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 I've I've been I visited with them again this week. Yeah, and I've talked to some today. You know, so it's a problem. And I told them I said, look. I don't know much about the shrimping business other than I love eating them. Yeah. You know, but I, I told them I visited one for hours. I said, bring your, bring your issues, put them in your writing, and let's categorize them one to whatever, and I'll help usher these things through. Whether it's having more people on the boards or, or whatever we need to do. It's a, it's an industry that's been in this state well before me and you and and it's it's important to this state, so mm -hmm. I want to help them. That, look, I told them I understand what it means to be in small business. I understand when you have to fight government every every way, and the government's not helping them. But why would we help foreign nationals sell their product on on the backs of our local people? That doesn't make any sense. What, what could a governor do to help out? That you know, industry? that's a good question. Uh, that's what I told them. I said, look, tell me what you need. You know, and I, I went to listen to him yesterday and I told him, I'm, look, we can sit around and talk and complain about all the problems, but what are we going to do to fix it? Yeah. You know, bring me the one, two, three, four, five, 10, 50, however many solutions they are, put them in writing, bring them to me 
help me get elected and I'll be your ally. And that would seem like a tough, you know, tough issue to tackle, right? Because yeah. You, you know, most the- Louisiana citizens, we love our, our Louisiana shrimp. Right. There's just something about the characteristics of that shrimp. Right. Sweet, just just tasty. Right. But then I understand, I guess, this foreign shrimp that's probably undercutting the prices, but I, I don't know how much, maybe 50% a lot. or, yeah. A lot. And so it's like, and now with, with, with inflation the way it is, I get that, like, people are more likely to go to cheaper shrimp, but I think, yeah, I don't know what what what, what can be done to just emphasize and no just buy support local yeah you know, I, think, I saw one of our customers tweet out um you know a message for a shrimper like hey buy from this guy yeah. and it got a lot of, of, of feedback i tell my wife this you know you already heard i'm a small business mm-hmm. guy so I, I i like going into small businesses and shopping and you know and you know the covid is is really hurt small business you know in that People are shopping online and not going to retail shops as much. And I mean, you can see it, you know, yeah. so, um, but that's just how I came up. I understand what it is to make an investment and in, in, in try to make that work. But look, I just told the shrimpers very simply, I want to help them. Yeah. I'll listen. You bring your plight. You, you, you bring your issues to the table. Some sound like they're federal issues. Like I can't fix important. Yeah, can you know. the state can the state issue a subsidy? No, like the Department of Agriculture. I don't, I don't know. know who would issue I, that. I think there's things we can do from a from a health standpoint that I'm, that uh, they wanted to share with me some of those things that can be done. So there's certainly a few things that can happen. But like I said, they 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 just need a governor who pays attention. And and look, this is what my commitment is to the people of Louisiana. I'm coming to work every day. I'm not jetting around the country, going to, taking trips to other countries. That's not what my. That's not what I do. Um, I enjoy going to work. I enjoy being around the people that that I work with, and and they just want you to leave your politics at the back door. So I'm um, I'm very interested in tackling these issues and sitting down, bringing all the parties to the table and figure out what we can do to move the ball. I mean, that's I've done that my entire life, and that's my skill set. Yeah, I remember in the, on the debate Friday. Did, did did you give out your cell phone or or probably? Or email? Yeah, yeah, I yeah. probably did. I I do that all the time. Yeah, just yeah. emphasizing that you're you're yeah. reachable. You know, yeah, absolutely. Um, by by the voter or just the Louisiana citizen. Um, so let's uh maybe change gears. I know you're busy right now. You're on the road constantly. When you do get a chance to relax. What are some things you like to do? Because we're a, a, like basically a good life show. Yeah. So what are what are some of the things you like well, to do? Well, this is my favorite time of year. I love smoking cigars, but I don't smoke them in the summer. Okay. And, you know, I'm a lightweight, so I I, um, I can only smoke them in the uh, fall and the winter. And there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, yeah. we see like it's typical for Louisiana cigar shops. Yeah. Our sales take a, a hit yeah. uh, uh, during the heat. I mean, yeah. most people smoke outdoors, so yeah. the weather really influences Absolutely. Our, our industry. Absolutely. So, I love cooking. Okay. Um, I love my fall cigars, uh, watching football, sitting outside, just jaw jacking with friends, um, just sitting relaxed and listening to music. I'm not I'm not a real complicated person, but I I will tell you this: I love sitting with people and talking about how to fix some problems going on in their lives, mm-hmm. especially spiritually. Um, you know, when you get older like me, you 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 know you're closer to the to the end than the beginning. So, I mean, I, I, I just sit around, listen to music, uh, enjoy cooking. Um, you know, I have a nice outdoor kitchen that we just moved for the 19th time in 38 years of marriage, third time in one subdivision, you oh, know, yeah. that we've moved. But, you know, I, this is my favorite time of year. And I um, look forward to um, getting this campaign over one way or the other and, and yeah. spend a little quality time at home. What do you like to cook? What are some favorite dishes? Oh, man, I love all things Mexican. Okay. You know, Come on. I'll, I'll, uh, I I I need Mexican food every night. In fact, yeah. I'm 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 ready to get out of here and go eat at Superior Grill before they close. Okay. You know? so, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I uh, know I love Mexican food. There's not a week that goes by I don't eat it at least once, maybe twice. If it was up up to me, I'd probably eat it three or four. My wife's a little Cajun girl, so yeah. You know, we I have Taco Tuesday. I was gonna every, say Taco Tuesday is probably celebrated every but week. But sometimes I have Taco Thursday and Taco Sunday. You know, okay. it just depends on on my mood. So you, you mentioned know. Superior grill uh one here in town yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah hang out they have to, one in new orleans too they do Street i hang out to one on government i have a little okay. house here in baton rouge that i stay at uh 
during the week and almost every Wednesday night I go hang out at, at Superior Grill on government. Yeah. And we're not endorsed by anyone, but yeah. have you had uh Barracuda taco no. on government? I don't know if no. you've heard of them. Uh-uh. Definitely check them out. Is that really... um, government taco? Uh, oh, they're on the called... other end of government. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So there's government called... taco. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, with, I don't um... know, I'm a creature of habit. You know, I like the atmosphere. I, I love to just go sit in there for an hour and drink tea and, mm-hmm. and I, I drink a whole, you know, I drink sweet and unsweet. Unsweet. Okay. You know, so, but I, I, look, I love the, I love the Latino culture. Okay. You know, my grandparents were from Mexico um, on my mother's side. My mother's a Mendez. So I've always, I told you, you don't remember this, but, you know, one of the things I was attracted to you and your dad, one about your partnership, and you always got that smile, you know, and that's sort of a, that's sort of a Hispanic trait, you know, um, um, it's something. It's just a culture, you yeah. know, the culture of family um, that that you see in, in the Latinos, that you see in some of the minority um, here in Louisiana. The Niger- Nigerian community is very close knit, and so is the Latino community. So, um, you know, I have a lot of friends in the Latino community, and um, I wish I could speak um, some Spanish. I I don't speak any, mm-hmm. you know, but. I do um, benefit from the the the, the bloodline because I get told all the time I don't look my age, you know, and I get accused of taking Botox shots, <laughs> and I don't take no shots, yeah. you know. But uh, so anyway, I mean, um, yeah, we were discussing like the the Hispanic population in New Orleans, especially from the Honduran commu- uh, community. Yeah, it's so big. I was I was told recently the largest population of Hondurans in America. Uh, or in in Louisiana, mm-hmm. and with a large, large portion of them living in Metro New Orleans. Yeah, you know, so um, nice to have their support, and um, you know, so um, I working in the construction industry, industry. So I'm around a lot of Latinos. My wife's a licensed contractor, so you know, we're very used to the culture and being around uh, Latinos a lot uh, through construction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just anecdotally, I mean, I feel like the the population of of Hispanics or Latinos have been increasing in Louisiana. I know a lot of it started with Katrina. Yeah, and they come in for jobs yeah. mostly, and and because look, if they weren't here after Katrina, we'd still be recovering, right? You know, so right. you got to find a balance. I, I I tell people, you know, I don't I don't want anything illegal going on, you know, but we we have to figure out how do you bring them into the workforce. So they can pay their taxes, and you know, mm-hmm. if they're gonna if they're gonna get paid, I want them to pay taxes just like I do. Yeah, I mean know? the immigration issue in this country has has been, I mean, ever present, right, since right. the founding. Um, and I think most, I would I would like to think most Americans would want legal immigration, especially getting talent from people outside this country and who are going to be productive, pay their taxes, play by the rules. Yeah, no one wants any like nefarious or just you know uh you know people who, who are right. going to be up to no good i think people i guess just, the issue from politicians is like how do we address that yeah like how do we, what kind of system do you put in place it's it's, it's governed by the feds you know okay. it's all federal law so the okay. state can't trump um federal federal law okay you know but i think everybody just wants to know what the what the rules are hmm. you know and, I, and, I, and i'm a big believer that the rules have to be the rules and then everybody live by those rules yeah you know yeah, I know with uh, the Hispanic community, especially Hondurans, I have a lot of friends back home in New Orleans who come from that community. Um, there, there's always been like this connection between Latin America and New Orleans. And I know right. a lot of it started in the 70s or before when, when especially our airport had mm-hmm. direct connections to Latin America. Right. Not so much anymore. I think a lot of it shifted to Texas, you know, mm-hmm. with these con- connections. But yeah, I mean, it'd be great to, you know, get get some of this talent, the skilled labor who, you know, they're, they're going to be productive citizens but um yeah let's let's yeah let's, i guess I, that's more of a federal issue i don't know what, what well, the state is, but can let's do. let's let's stop um hiding behind the fact that if it wasn't for the latino community that construction industry would be lost right so let's let's own up to it and let's figure out how do we move forward and how do we get everybody playing playing by the rules mm-hmm. you know so nobody wants any I- illegal folks or people who are cheating the system or anything so um we got to work with the feds and, and, and figure that out. We have a, a large Latino population in this state, and it's time um, that a governor recognizes that, and I will have people close to me 
um, so we can keep close, close tabs on, on, on what do we need to do. We have a, a ton of Latino kids in our schools because even if you're illegal, if your kids are here or if you're born here, you're a U.S. citizen. You know, yeah. so there's problems with that because you have little bambinos that are born here, um, and they can't do certain things because their parents aren't legal. Yeah. So it's a problem. It's a yeah. problem. I think I think recognizing that's a problem is the first part to moving to towards a solution. Yeah. But you haven't had anybody to really drive that conversation because I don't know hardly any Hispanics in in the legislature. Yeah, you don't see uh, representatives reflecting no, that I mean, that population. Huh? We might have one or two. I don't want to. I don't want to, you know, leave anybody out. I don't can't think of okay. one off the top of my head. Yeah. You know, I just haven't seen a lot. Helena mm. Moreno had had a Latino background oh, yeah. when she was there, but besides her, I don't recall having somebody that speaks fluent Spanish since I've been there. Mm -hmm. That I, like I said, that person may exist. I, I, I can't think of it off the top of my head. Yeah, which isn't good. It ought to be four, five, or six come right off the top. And I don't know if you have this information, but maybe you can provide insight anecdotally. How how does that community tend to vote? Like if you want to stereotype, or I mean, yeah. if you have numbers, they, do they, they lean conservative? You know, I don't even know, but I, I I don't know where they lean, but but I know they don't vote okay. very well. You know, it's a small percentage of them actually vote. Yeah, and that's a problem in itself. Mm -hmm. So they have some people working with inside the community to try to get people registered and get them engaged. But there's a communications problem. They walk inside the booth. They don't even know how to use it. You know, the, the, nobody's ever taught them how to use it. They haven't seen it before. And there's a, there's a translation problem, right? So they walk in a booth. And I was told this just so they walk in a the booth. They don't understand. They just leave. Wow. Yeah. They'll just leave? Just leave. Hmm. Now, you and I wouldn't even think about that. Yeah. You know, I mean, you they get you there and then you get in, you don't understand how to work the electronics and you just play like you voted and leave. Yeah. And so. I know there's, this is a contentious issue, right? Like if, if you have talking about Hispanics coming in, you know, should they adapt right to learning English or do some institutions help and offer that bilingual, you know, option, I guess uh, look, I think when it comes have, to say voting. Yeah. Look, look, I'm a military guy. I'm a veteran. And I think if you, if you're, in this country and and you 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 living by our laws and our regulations and our, our english language is english language right you know that doesn't say you shouldn't be able to use your hispanic or whatever uh language vietnamese or whatever um but i i say this often that you shouldn't force your will on somebody else's free will mm. you know if it's good for the goose, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, English language is the, is the language of choice in the United States and certainly here in Louisiana. And, and that's ultimately, um, you know, you have to, you have to learn. And to it's get practical. Along. Yeah. yeah I it's, get, practical. Right. it's not practical to, to start, um, something else. Cause how do you, how do you even get along in, when you go get a job in a career when most people talk English? I don't, I have no problem communicating you know, I don't, I don't want, I don't go places where, um, I guess if I went to a Vietnamese village or, or something like that, you'd have trouble, but I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm certainly symp sympathetic to listening and seeing how we can make things better and how our cultures could match, uh, up together. But, you know, um, um, but we'll see, you know, yeah. I, I, I think, I think the most important thing from my perspective is being willing to engage, listen, and see how we can fix problems, no matter what your nationality is, or not your nationality, but whatever your culture, whether it's Hispanic, um, Chinese, Vietnamese, you know, Canadian, or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, how do we all mesh together and make Louisiana the best state in the nation? That's what I'm. Yeah. That's what I work towards. Yeah. So. No, it's well said. Especially, I mean, Louisiana as a state has always been one that's been open to so many cultures. I mean, think about New Orleans, all the different backgrounds that. Yeah. Have, enter to that That's port. What New is. Yeah, we're just a gumbo, right? So gumbo. I saw the other day, uh just going down Airline Highway, I saw a church that had a sign that said, We teach English on whatever, you yeah. know, Wednesdays. So I thought that's pretty interesting. I guess they're they're and you know it was in Spanish. They're they're trying yeah. to communicate to the Hispanic community, yeah. look, you, we you, we're here to like help you out. At least yeah, if you teach towards Kenner, I think Kenner's population is close to twenty percent Hispanic or maybe yeah. more. You know, it's a it's a big Hispanic population. Mm -hmm. So yeah. 
But anyway. but yeah, getting them you know in the fold and in the system, and that you know even voting exercise. Yeah, the it vote. takes time, and I would tell you if they're not in the system already, mm-hmm. they're not getting in the system in three weeks. You know, yeah. so well, that's something I'll have to work on you know, yeah. in, over the over the course of the future. And uh, so you talk you talk about when you're you're at home relaxing. This is your favorite time of year, cooking. Uh, you watch sports. Who are some of your favorite teams? Oh man, I like football. Um, you know, I don't like all the culture wars though. Okay. So I don't like watching football transform into some culture statement. So there was a while I wouldn't watch the NFL games, but you know, I like the Saints. You can't grow up and not like the Saints. So right. I've only watched two full football games since football has started again this season, and that's been both Saints games. I haven't watched an LSU game. Um, I've been campaigning. Um um i want to try to find it on an internet before saturday yeah um, but i haven't had a chance to do that yet but i love football i love college football i love high school football i used to have my own high school radio show uh with a with a friend of mine for years and oh come I, on yeah i used to do color before politics so i probably did it from like um, um late 90s uh till about 2008 I did it for about eight or nine years. I loved it. Okay. I'd go travel around, do doing the color for different games around the state. And then once my kids got into high school and then when I got into politics, I haven't done it since I've been in politics. Okay. So. Yeah. This, uh, for people outside the state of Louisiana, I mean, high school football yeah. is huge. Here. It is. It's it is. an institution. But I look, I, I love business. I love um, talking business. I like talking math, you know, mm-hmm. one plus one equals two. And it's not what you make. It's what you save. I, I want to I want to be like Dave Ramsey one day. Yeah. You know, so that's what I do. That's my hobby. I'll sit around on Saturdays, talk about business with with people. I love talking with young young entrepreneurs who want to start a business and what it takes to start a business and what it takes to sustain a business and stay in business. Cuz most people don't have that discipline. Everybody wants to be in business, but they yeah. don't have the the tools and the and that background and, that, and the ability to stay in business. That's interesting you bring that up because we have people all the time, our customers, who express that sentiment of, oh, I would love to do this, you know, what you're doing, selling cigars. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I tell them, well, look, are you ready to basically be, basically be a glorified janitor? Because that's yeah. what we are. Yeah. I mean, we're small business, so, you know, I'm there cleaning the toilets. You don't see that, right? It's not just me smoking cigars all day and watching that cash register ring. So it's, it's not, not, all, it's not, not glor- all glory, man. Yeah. Yeah, not all glory. There's a lot of work behind the scenes that people don't people don't realize it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So we we you know, we we get that too. And and for me, I would love to see more of an entrepreneurial uh, culture in this state. I think that would help attract. Well, government doesn't breed that. And that's yeah. That's and that's one, not the role of government. But well, it's not the role. But but government could also not be in the way. Yeah. You know, and not put up obstacles, and and it should be easier and quicker to, to get through the processes than it takes. You know, you can't get a phone call return from the Department of Revenue. You know, the Department of Treasury, and you can test me. And if something happens, this is how you get in the most trouble with the Department of Treasury. If you don't return a phone call or email within 24 hours. That's my standard. Now, is it perfect? No, but that's what that's my standard that I, that I hold my staff to. Um, because we're, we're here to work for people. And if you can't return their phone call in 24 hours then you're not doing your job yeah now you may not fix it in 24 hours but acknowledge that they've they've called you yeah i know uh at least in baton rouge there's an app i'm sure you're familiar with it i think it's called 311 or red stick ready something like that and if there's an issue like let's say they missed the garbage pickup you know they make it easy to where you can just go on the app open up a ticket and at least it's in their queue so local government has that i mean i don't know if the state offers anything like that or if that would be practical but i would tell you the state's way behind when it comes to technology and there's a we have a long way to go to catch up Mm -hmm. um so i have a question uh from our producer if you become governor what would success mean to you um in other words what is a metric in which you can measure a successful tenure as governor you know i'm about the basics not doing the little things right because if you don't do the little things, the big things aren't going to happen. So, you know, the problem that I see right now in Baton Rouge is we're sort of crumbling at the foundation, and we have to go in and fix our foundation um, because I just don't believe we're functioning properly. And that's not fancy campaign talk, but that's reality. 
And if we're going to improve the outcomes of government, then you have to provide the services that we're supposed to provide in a quick, expedient, accountable, and transparent way. That's why I want to be the governor. And that's why I'll commit four years. I'm not even talking about eight years. We have some difficult decisions to make. We have to we have to bring ourselves into the get out of the stone age in many cases. And um, so, I mean, I, I think the most important thing for me, I want you to trust your governor. I want you to trust the fact that he goes to work every day looking out for the little guy. The big guys can got them. They got their own back, but. I want a governor that goes to work every day taking care of things that doesn't screw the little guys. Mm -hmm. You know, 85% of the people go to work every day, pay their taxes, follow the rules. Well, 15% don't, Mm -hmm. you know, so I am a little guy. I represent the 85%. It's time. Somebody is the governor of this state that represents the 85 percentile. So how do I judge what I do really about how people, the perception of service, and 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 I want people to be proud of me being their governor. That I'm not in it for myself. That I'm going to clean up the cronyism and move us, start move us in the right direction. Because the bottom line is, we need 30 years of good government, not four. You know, I'm 62, so I'll serve one term, fix what I can fix, put the foundation in place, and the next governor is going to have to come in and build the walls. Because the problems that face this state in crime and education especially education and healthcare, we're very poor, uneducated, um, unhealthy state. Well, that's generational pr- fixes. Mm-hmm. You're not going to fix that overnight. And I tell people this all the time, not to get spiritual, but because I am spiritual, but not to preach. God did not intend for teachers to raise our children. God intended mom and dad to raise their children. Now we want our schools to feed them, clothe them, love them, be mom, be dad, be policeman, be counselor, be everything. Almost taking on the role as a parent, huh? Taking a role. Hmm. Our teachers are taking on the roles of parents. And I tell people, they talk about our education problem. I said, we got a family problem. We got a family culture problem. And and we want teachers to do what God intended mom and dad to do. Hmm. And that's a problem. You know, so... You know, I just want to move the ball in the right direction. I think we first have to restore some faith that we're making the decisions. The decision-making comes from the right place. You know, that's those are the basics. Yeah. And we don't do the basics well. And I want to get us back to where we're making the basic decisions well. Yeah. So, so if let's say the legislature brings up a bill and they're all unanimous about implementing um, tenured yeah. uh, or um, limits on, on uh, term limits. Yeah. Well, how, how would you, would you, no, would we you... already have term limits. So I, I look, I tell people this, if the legislature sends you a bill to sign, that's a super majority, you know, it'd be, I, I don't know what the situation would be where I wouldn't sign that bill. It wouldn't be, I would not, not sign it over politics. And that's what you see happen. Hmm. But I mean, if you respect the process and I defended this process, then the, and the legislature represents the 4.6 million people, and they send you legislation that they've debated, gone through the process, and they send it to the governor's desk. I think in most cases, um, and and I, I just would have to you'd have to give me an example because I mean if if we're communicating properly, I know what's going on, they know what's going on. I think the biggest problem is the lack of communication and understand as things move through the process. I've served in the legislature. Nobody else in this race has, you know, or, or Sharon you has. Um, another one dropped out the race today. But I think I think the key is I understand the process. And if I have a problem with something, I hope to tell them early on and head that off. Yeah, and, and let me clarify, like, with term limits, maybe, like, for all political office. Because I guess, I guess part of the problem is you have some career politicians, right? Yep. And sometimes they affect – change for good but the, there are plenty that just kind of use the office yeah they do but look, let me tell you i firmly believe that the locals need to control what the locals control we need to hmm. decentralize the power out of baton rouge and push it down to the locals where you hold hmm. your local officials af- uh, accountable i don't think i ought to be the one deciding whether bozier parish has term limits or not that came up today while i was in, oh. in shreveport um 
that's not for the governor to decide. I think that's for the locals to decide. We, we, we send too much power. There's too much decision-making that's happening in Baton Rouge, and we need to decentralize a, a lot of that and send it to the locals to decide on their own Yeah, and get out of the business of trying to run local politics. Mm-hmm. What so, other candidate do you find yourself agreeing with most? Um, you know, they all say things that I can agree on, but this is really about – um, you know, my, my skill set's different than all of them. You know, you got somebody that's been a lifetime bureaucrat. You got uh, 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 in Sean Wilson and just, you know, he's very, very educated. Um, you got Stephen Wagsback, who's a lifetime policy wonk sort of thing. I don't mean that in a negative, negative way. He's a policy guy. Works at Lobby, paid big dollars for policy people to go figure out what's what's best practice and he's learned that you know then you got guys like uh hunter lundy who's who's self-made he's probably got more in common with me than anybody else uh sharon hewitt's a mom engineer um served in the state senate for two terms you know what i bring to the table military well you got jeff landry who's attorney general he's a lawyer Spent some time with the sheriff's office, you know, whatever. You know, I bring a blue-collar work ethic through my businesses that that we've owned. Um, my first career was in law enforcement. <clears throat> so in, 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 in a um, career at a high level with, a, you know, in the military and what I did. But so I don't really have much in common other than we're all running for the same position. But I bring different experiences, and very simply, I tell people this: if you want government to run like a business, you know, as I said earlier, you got three lawyers, two engineers, and a business guy in the top six now. So uh, I clearly bring something different to the table. Very good. So we're going to wrap it up. Um, we have one final segment. Uh, hopefully, you can uh, join us. It's it's basically a rapid fire yeah. uh, round. So I hope you can. Uh, you want to participate? Yeah. Pre, pre, my wife's, it, keep, keep my wife's waiting on me to take her to dinner. Though. Yeah, yeah. So oh, yeah. We don't want to. We don't want to <clears throat> delay. So, number one, Tabasco, Crystal, or other? Tabasco. Okay. Number two, favorite vacation destination. Um, favorite vacation. Any major league baseball park, city. Ooh. Okay. Number three, the ideal person you would want to smoke a cigar with, alive or deceased. My father. Desert Island cigar. If you have a favorite brand or. No. Okay. Number five. Who would who would you want to see on a future podcast here? Um, my wife. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Well, Mr. John, thank you very much for joining me. Oh, I appreciate this. Yeah. So, well, good luck to you and your campaign, and thank uh, you. thank yeah, we'll you. be watching how how it unfolds. So, give my best to your dad. I will. Thank All you. Right, and until the next cigar, thanks for tuning in, everyone. Yeah. <laughs>